Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner. We're covering the final section of Chapter 6, um, Ferromagnetism, in uh, Griffith's Introduction to Electrodynamics, 2nd edition. So now we're going to finally talk about what is going on with these magnets and, and um, you know, why they have a magnetization at all and how it kind of behaves. So um, in, in linear media, in, you know, most other forms of matter besides ferromagnets um, and, you know, things like nickel and stuff like that, um, once you remove the external field, the material returns to having no magnetism of its own. Um, ferromagnets, however, they have a memory of the magnetization they had, and as you can see here, even though I'm not subjecting this to any current, it has a magnetic field that you know that you can interact with other objects all around you. Okay, so I mean that's the way the the ferromagnets work, and the 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 microscopic effect that's happening is. Um, for quantum mechanical reasons, which sounds like a cop out, but you know when you get into quantum mechanics, you'll understand more of why these things behave the way they do. Um, the dipoles within the material uh, tend to align. They really, really um, tend to align. And if if the the ferromagnet had its way, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to get them to not align. You know, but uh, Thanks to um, what really happens is you actually get these these crystal patches of domains where everything's perfectly aligned at a very microscopic scale, and there's a beautiful picture in the book um, of you know an etched piece of iron that shows these these alignments. And when you subject um, uh, this piece of iron to a magnetic field, um, what happens is at the borders of these domains, the ones that align with it grow while the ones that don't shrink. They basically trade atoms um, in some kind of like a market or something like that. But, uh, but anyway, um, so the, the end result is that um, you start with, let's draw here a kind of a, a graph, I'll kind of make it big. Okay, so this is the magnetization on this vertical axis, and this is the current that we're putting through uh, wires looped around the iron substance. Okay, So we start off with a piece of iron that has no magnetization, and as we ramp up that current, it's going to produce a magnetization until it reaches some point we call saturation. At that point, increasing the current won't change the magnetization of the material because everything's aligned in that direction. Now, if you turn down the current, you take your current knob and turn it down, you're gonna find that the magnetization ends up with a, a positive value um, even though you don't have any current running through. So, you know, basically imagine you had a dial um, where you can, you know, control how much current is flowing through the wires that wrap this, this, uh, this, uh, this iron piece of metal. And if you start off with zero current and then increase it, you know, you reach a saturation point where increasing it more doesn't change the magnetization. So you can just kind of draw this out as far as you want, but this is the point of saturation right there. And then as you decrease the current and back to zero, it's going to have uh, a memory of the magnetization it used to have. Now, if you want to get the magnetization back to zero, you have to turn the current the other way, and then it's going to go past and then hit this point right here. At this point, if you turn the current off, then the magnetization of the material would be zero. Okay, But just like on this side, you know, it's going to create a mirror image and hit another saturation point here, where if you just keep in decreasing the current, the magnetization won't change. And likewise, when you decrease the current back to zero, you're going to hit a point here where the magnetization will be completely opposite, even though you have no current running through it. And you can, you know, turn the current back up, hit this point here, and then go back up to your saturation point, okay? And this is, we call this a hysteresis loop, okay? So we have a memory of where we were on this loop. And um, if you look closely at the slope of how the, the magnetization responds to the current, you'll see that there is a proportional factor there. It just changes depending on where you're at in the loop. Okay. Um, so um, the interesting thing is that the um, magnetization is much greater than you'd expect for a small amount of current. This is why people, if you want to build a strong magnet, you're going to use iron. You just, you're going to use iron. You know, so those giant, uh, 
those giant MRI machines probably have a giant piece of iron that they wrapped a bunch of wire around in order to generate that uh, that massive magnetic field. And it's it's such a point. So let's draw this graph down here. So this is um, the value mu naught h, um, and then we magnify this by 10,000. Okay. Then over here we have the magnetic field B, and I believe this is in uh, Teslas. Um, anyway. But uh, basically what happens is this hysteresis loop that you get looks something like this. Okay, and over here you have the value of 1, and over here you have the value of, I think it's like 20. Okay, so at a very small, you know, 20 times 1 ten thousandths of the magnetic field, you get a very huge magnetization. Okay, so... Um, and the reason for that is that the, the, the dipoles inside the material really do like to line up. There's, there's a, a reason for that that, again, I can't really explain unless I get into quantum mechanics. Um, one interesting thing is the Curie point, okay? Okay, this is 770 degrees Celsius centigrade and for iron. Okay, now you'd think that the, the random motions of the, uh, the dipoles within the material would knock some of these dipoles out of line, particularly at the borders, but that doesn't happen as long as the iron is below 770 degrees centigrade. Okay, Once you reach that point, then you go through a phase transition, just like from ice to water. Okay, And the iron behaves exactly like a paramagnetic material. Okay, um, there's, enough, there's enough force with the collisions because of the temperature that the, magnetic, the magnetization of the material won't last. It's, it's directly proportional to the um, to the uh, field that it's subjected to. So that's pretty much all there is to know about how ferromagnets actually work. In the next chapter, we're going to learn what happens when you have currents and changing currents, and you have magnetic fields that are changing, and how that that interacts with charges. So um, while now we understand what's going on inside of this guy, we still don't know the answer as to why these two guys. Well, actually, you do. You do know that you know th this has this basically acts as if there's a current flowing around, a bound current, okay. And so we know that that you know a current interacts with the magnetic field. And near a solenoid, which these are basically solenoids, um, if the magnetic fields align, they tend to attract. If they if they are not aligned, they will repel. So so now we know a little bit there. Now if if you really look closely at these magnets, you'll note that the orientation matters. Um, these aren't quite as simple a magnetic field as you would uh, expect to see in a in a real solenoid. There's there's probably some some different domains here. Um, you know maybe maybe it's aligned this way. You know let's see if I can get it to let's see that that attracts. Oop! Do it one more time here. Uh, let's get these guys to align. Come on, align. There, stick, stick, stick. Okay, are you happy? Okay, there. Now if I take this guy, yep, and this guy should repel. Yep. So, I guess the magnetization is actually, um, you know, parallel with the surface rather than, you know, this way, as you might expect. So, anyway, I hope you had fun in Chapter 6. Um, I certainly did. Um, much more fun than I did back in Chapter uh, four. So anyway, take care. Have a good time. Goodbye.